Hey everyone, great to see so many of you. Thanks so much for coming out this evening. My name is Bill Randall, and I teach gerontology here at St. Thomas University. So the first question I ask is, can you hear me okay? <laughs> Good. Um, along with my colleagues and friends, uh, Michelle LaFrance, Sue McKenzie Moore, Beth McKim, and Rebecca Whedon, plus our various research associates, uh, including Dolores Furlong of UNB and others around the world, I'm involved with something called the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Narrative, or CERN as we like to call it, which is the sponsor of tonight's very exciting event. Uh, in the brochure that you should have in your hands, you'll find information about CERN, and about the uh, extensive resource collection that we have available in our office, which is located in Brian Mulroney Hall, just across the quadrangle, and information about how to contact us if you're doing research related to narrative so that we can assist you. You'll also find information on some of our upcoming uh, activities and projects, including our new online uh, open access peer-reviewed journal called Narrative Works, Issues, Investigations, and Interventions. So we invite you to visit our website, www.stu.ca slash CIRN, C-I-R-N, uh, to learn more about this uh, and other uh, exciting ventures. Um, last year at this time, our CERN team were busy planning Narrative Matters 2010, which was the fifth in a series of uh, interdisciplinary international conferences uh, devoted to exploring the storied richness and complexity of human life. I'm happy to report that the conference was a great success and that we're now working with our European colleagues to plan Narrative Matters 2012 to be held at the American University of Paris in France. So check our website in the coming months for more information on how you might uh, submit a proposal. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to call on Dr. Kathleen McConnell, professor in our English department here at St. Thomas, and an author in her own right, to introduce the person that, of course, you've come to hear this evening, Dr. Sherry Fitch. But before I do, I'm afraid I have a few more uh, things to mention. The first is that immediately uh, after Sherry's lecture and the question and answer period that I'm sure will follow, we invite you to adjourn to the foyer where you can mingle and chat and where you can meet Sherry herself uh, and get her to sign one of her books for you, thanks to Kim Richard and the Canvas Bookstore, who's organized a great book display at Sherry's publications. I also have to uh, ask you, please, would you turn off these things, uh, cell phones, blackberries, crackberries, whatever you call them, uh, for obvious reasons, or at least uh, turn them to the mute function, or if you want a little bit of a thrill, the vibrate function. <laughs> the next item I want to mention is especially important. This is CERN's third annual public lecture in narrative, and its second since renaming the series the John McEndee Memorial Lecture in Narrative. Professor McEndee, as many of you may know, was instrumental in founding CERN and was a core member of our coordinating team until his tragic and untimely death two years ago. John passionately explored the interplay of discourse and narrative in relation particularly to justice work in society. His research, teaching, and activism all reflected this passion. It was John, uh, for instance, who first proposed the idea of a reading circle. Uh, John envisioned us making space over the cold winter months where students, faculty, staff, and folks from the community could gather to read aloud to each other and discuss the role of story in our lives. Uh, the first such reading circle, uh, which uh, focused on uh, Massey lecturer Thomas King's book, The Truth About Stories, A Native Narrative, went very well indeed. So we want you to, again, check our CERN website in the coming weeks for details on the reading circle that we're planning for this winter, too, when we'll be dipping into Canadian journalist Robert Fulford's intriguing and I think very discussable book, uh, The Triumph of Narrative, Storytelling in the Age of Mass Culture. It's not a very big book, it's kind of a, a nice uh, uh, size, so I think you'll enjoy reading from that in the reading circle. Stay tuned. Also last year at this time, as a way of making space for the kind of contemplative reflection which John so valued and practiced in his life, we placed a bench with a commemorative plaque 
on the balcony outside of Brian, Brian Mulroney Hall, uh, just near the CERN office window. We would warmly invite you to make use of this space and this bench, however you wish, for reading, for conversation, and for contemplation. It's in John's memory that we dedicated it as we have dedicated this lecture series. One quick word about the workshop that uh, Sherry is offering tomorrow afternoon. It's uh, uh, referred to in the brochure that you have. It's going to be taking place in the conference room in Holy Cross House, which is here on the St. Thomas campus. There's no fee for this workshop, uh, but space is limited. So we uh, need to have a sense of how many of you are planning to attend. I think we already have well over 25 uh, that have registered for uh, this in, in advance. So if you think, as you're sitting there, gee, I'd like to take part of that too. We have a few more spaces uh, left. And the person that you want to see during the break time or during the time out of the foyer is Rebecca. Can you stand up, Rebecca, for us? She's the person in the buttonhole. Uh, and get your name on the list, and she'll be coming in off at 50, I think, won't you? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, thanks, uh, too, to uh, Lily Boisson and Alex Solak, who are our videographers this evening, and a special thanks to Tracy House, who has eased our anxieties greatly. She's our mic and tech expert this evening. And to the students in my uh, Wednesday evening class in gerontology who graciously volunteered uh, to act as brochure hander utters and general bouncers. <laughs> now then, without any further fussing on my part, let me call upon Dr. McConnell to introduce Dr. Pitt. <laughs> for me. That's coming. Uh, okay, so there's the stuff that everybody knows and expects to hear reiterated in one of the in introductions. Sherry Fitch, author, educator, literacy advocate, grew up in Miramichi, Moncton, and Fredericton, got her honors English BA from St. Thomas in 1987 and her honorary doctorate from Stu just last spring. 1987 also saw the publication of her first book, Toes in My Nose, which you gotta think about it, she was finishing her degree and she was publishing this book and raising her kids at the same time. And that book was, uh, I didn't realize it, but it was illustrated by Molly Lambobeck. And since that time, she's written more than 25 books, from children's verse to adult fiction. Her best-selling children's book, Sleeping Dragons All Around, won the Atlantic Booksellers Award in 1990. She's also won the Mr. Christie Award, the Anne Connor Grinner Award, the Vicki Met Metcalf Award, etc., etc. Her book of poetry for grown-ups, In This House Are Many Women, I always do show and tell, um, was published by Goose Lane in 1992 and reissued in 2005. A book of poems, two issues. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, her first adult novel, Kiss the Joy As It Flies, I'm holding up my version of it, which was borrowed from me and not returned, <laughs> which is a thing that makes me very sad and also very happy because I felt a rich imaginative life for my copy of the book, which has gone on to more and better reading. So that's always good. Um, that was shortlisted for the Stephen Leacock Award for Humor. Fitch is a tireless advocate for literacy as her new book that she's going to read from tonight, her YA book, uh, Pluto's Ghost, uh, shows the protagonist of this book is a young boy who's dealing with literacy problems and how that affects his life in very serious manners. She's worked and, read, work, uh, worked and led workshops from the Arctic to Bhutan. Okay, that's just A to B. Uh, from Anacostia to Belize, China, Kenya, Mexico, Tanzania, Thailand, Uganda, and Vietnam, all over the United States, all over Canada. So that's the kind of stuff that you expect to hear in one of these introductions, but that kind of list of accomplishments doesn't come close to encapsulating the warmth and whimsy, the sheer word drunkenness 
of the woman. <laughs> for example, the thesis she wrote for Russ Hunt back in 1987 was only, oh, a mm, hundred or so pages over the limit. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, I use an anthology for, uh, in one of my classes, an anthology that she's in, and I let the students pick which of the authors from this anthology we'll cover in class. But after the first couple of years, I said, okay, you can't pick Sherry Fitch. We are going to do her first. But you have to read some of the other people in the anthology, too. Um, fortunately, my introduction doesn't have to explain her in all her magnificence. You're about to see that in her talk. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to give you Sherry Fitch. There are sleeping dragons all around, and so I must tiptoe tiptoe. Softly as I pass, when there are sleeping dragons all around, I must be quiet. I must not make one sound. Those dragons are asleep, but I'm awake, and I've got to get downstairs to get some mocha, maple, chocolate, cake. So shh, shh, tiptoe, tiptoe, here I go. It used to be tradition that a storyteller couldn't speak until they'd paused and stilled shh, and asked for guidance to speak. I tonight especially want to ask you to um, join me in silence for just a minute to reflect on the man um, to whom this lecture is given and so that I can offer these words up in the silence and in his memory just for a minute. Tell me a story, tell me a story, tell me a story, and then I'll go to bed. I grew up hearing my mother sing that to me. My mother's the reason I'm here tonight. O oh, wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, from whose unseen presence the leaves driven. For I am the daughter of the earth and water, and the nursling of the sky. I pass through the pores of the oceans and shores, I change. My father. I was a blessed child because I grew up in a home that two parents knew the power of song and chant and prayer and the spoken word and poetry. You know, my dad went to school at a time when they made them, for punishment, recite great poetry, memorize and recite the great poetry. And I always, and he ended up being a Mountie, so I always think, well, I'm glad he did a lot of bad things so he knew all that poetry and ended up a Mountie. But I very much am um, here because of that oral tradition in my home. So I'm honored to be here tonight, too, because if you were me and I were you for just a day or maybe two, then maybe you and maybe me would see the me that you were, too. You see, the you I think you want to be never, ever speaks to me. See, if you knew the me I am and I could know the you you be, I think we would eventually discover we liked broccoli. Yeah, we could form the broccoli bunch, invite each other out to lunch, share our little broccoli trees, cover them with melted cheese. But you pass me by without a smile as if I were a crocodile. Then look the other way in case you see the me that's in my face. If you could wear my sneakers, you might have to plug your nose, and I could wear your shoes even if they scrunched my toes, then maybe you and me could see the us we never got to meet, the you and me that might have found more broccoli to eat. <laughs> if you could wear my sneakers is a poem in a book called If You Could Wear My Sneakers. And do you know what that book is dedicated to? That man over there on that portrait, Dr. Noel Kinsella. Dr. Noel Kinsella is also the reason I stand in front of you tonight. My father and my mother and their wisdom at a time in my life when they knew I needed someone to listen to me. 
brought me to Dr. Kinsella, who took me across the hall to Larry Batt and said she wants to sign up for an English course. That's what she wants to do. And I went, really? <laughs> when I talked to, um, when Bill called and asked me to do this, I was so excited because I was honored given my doctorate in May, and honored to be asked to do the convocation speech, but they only gave me seven minutes. <laughs> seven minutes. I take more than seven minutes when I'm going through the Tim Hortons drive through to get my coffee, okay? <laughs> I really, really do. I'm the person you don't want to leave the voicemail message on the end of your phone. That's like telling me, I don't know, it's like t saying, do a tongue twister, seven minutes, and it's, and it's over. So when Bill called, I think it's that he took pity on me because he knew I had so much more I wanted to say. So they gave me an hour, we're going to be here till midnight, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, my mom and dad tell this story, that, and I don't know if it's true, you'll have to ask them after, that when I was little, when I um, went to get my tonsils out, that um, the doctor thought it would be a really good idea to clip my tongue. It's true, mom, isn't it? And they clipped the cord underneath my tongue because I had a tongue that was too big for this mouth. Can you imagine how much I would have talked if they hadn't clipped my tongue? <laughs> now that's a true story. I don't know if there's any reason why I grew up to write tongue twisters because of that. But Bill and I talked about what what I wanted to talk about. I said, you know, should I just come do my stories? And he said, talk from your heart, talk from your experience. Um, you don't have to talk from theory. And so it's all about me tonight. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to tell you and share with you um, some of what I think are the, they're the true things that have happened to me in the course of 25 years. And truthfully, when I remember saying to a friend of mine in my early 20s, all I really want to do is tell stories. That's all I want to do. And she was like, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I just want to tell stories. And I didn't say I want to be a storyteller. I just wanted to tell stories. And I think that's what I'm still doing. Sometimes, yes, they end up in a book. And sometimes they are just stories that I sit with a friend and we talk to each other. But I still need to tell stories. And I'm glad that that need has ended up taking me where it has. So um, the first story I wanted to start with was it's connected to St. Thomas. I, I was so glad to come here and so happy and so excited and, 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 and discovering my voice and all of that stuff. I mean, it, St. Thomas was this amazing place for me, a safe place for me. And when I went to leave, and you know, as a result of being in Russ Hunt's class and, and seeing somebody really value children's literature, knowing I wanted to write children's books, I made the decision that I would go on and study at the master's level, that I would study children's literature at the master's level. And a really well-meaning friend, and they're long gone, and nobody knows who this person is in the room, but I can tell this story now, sat me down and said, okay, Sherry, I want to talk to you. Um, I know you're going on to do your master's. That's wonderful. You're going to go and study more. But I have to ask you, like, why are you going to study children's literature? And the implication was that it was a lesser literature than adult literature. It's like, you know, you're a good English student, and you could really study, like, the real thing kind of thing. And, um, and I, in my, I can be known to do this when I get fierce, my mother bear fierceness that can come out at times. I felt kind of mother bear fierceness about children's literature. I said, that's not, what do you mean? I said, it's an important literature. It's, it's the literature children come to first. It's how do we foster a love of learning and books and all of that if they don't have a wonderful positive experience with children's books. And so I, and he's like, calm down, calm down. Like I really was mad. I felt very defensive and very passionate that we didn't kind of say because it's for children, it's a lesser thing, you know. I, I, I wanted to defend this, this thing I decided to do too. I wanted to justify why I was doing what I had to do. And he said, he really did, he said, okay, okay, calm down, and all right, so just do me a favor, Sherry. He said, when you've gone and done your master's and studied and finished it, and I said, I'm going to study the oral tradition of children's poetry because I think that's really important because I think it, it forms community, and I think there's something really important about that. He said, okay, well, good. Well, when you're finished, come back and answer a question that I'm going to pose to you right now. I said, okay, what, what is it? And he went, well, first I have to tell you a story. 
<laughs> and that's exactly what he said. So I said, okay. And the story goes something like this, and I'm going to shorten it a bit. He made it very dramatic. But he said, a, a few years ago, I was doing my PhD thesis, and I went over to Ireland to do some research. And he said, on the way back from Ireland, um, the plane that I was on started experiencing engine difficulty. And he said, it was really interesting what happened on that plane. It shows you the, the difference of, that people are. He said some people wanted to drink, some people started to swear, some people started crying. He said the woman beside me kept grabbing my arm and white knuckling my arm and every time, you know, it, 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 we had went over, had more, you know, bumps and all this stuff. He was like, and he was making this thing and he said, and I had white marks on my arms from where she was grabbing me and I was listening and he said, and I was thinking of my dissertation underneath my seat and I thought all that work, all that truth, the world is never going to know because the plane's going down, you know. He went on and on like this and then he said, but obviously he said we landed. And he said where we landed was in Newfoundland. And of course, those of us who are Maritimes, we know, he said, and what they did is they, the, in the airport in Newfoundland, they herded them all into the bar. That's what they did. You know, oh, you've had a rough time. Come on into the bar. I mean, it just makes so much sense to me. And he said, so I went in the bar. He said, I ordered a whiskey. And he said, sure enough, he said, the arm grabber woman who made the white thumbprints in my arm pulled up a stool beside me. And he thought, oh, not her again. And she turned to him and she said, and this is a true story. He, he, he told it to me. He said, she turned to me and she said, I'm really sorry that I lost it. I'm really sorry. You were so good to me. Thank you for being so calm. And he said, you know, I really was surprised at myself how calm I'd remained. And I said to her, well, yes, I'm surprised I remained so calm in a time of crisis. And, and, uh, and he said, it, you know, it, it was great. And she said, he said, she looked at him and she threw her head back and she started laughing in that kind of way that you think people who aren't ever going to stop laughing laugh, you know. He was like that. She was like, ah, ha, 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 ha. Don't you know what you were doing? And he said, yes, I was reading my magazine. And she said, oh, yeah? She said, well, first of all, that magazine was upside down. <laughs> it was. And she said, and you weren't reading it. She said, what you were doing is you were rocking back and forth a little bit like this, and you were saying, hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped <laughs> over the moon. She said, the whole time you were reciting Mother Goose. So he looked at me, and we were in my, my living room, and I had a picnic table for a dining room table then. And he leaned across the, the dining room table, and he said, so Sherry, what I want to know when you're finished your master's degree and started studying children's literature is why, when, you were closer, when I was closer to death than I've ever been in my entire life, did I start reciting Mother Goose? And I looked at him, and I said, I don't have to go study at a master's level to tell you the answer that, to that question. You went back to the poetry of your childhood because it took you back to a safe place. In the moment of the telling of the story or the poem, there is the creation of a safe place. I believe that with all my heart. Those of you who are in drama, those of you who, who read stories in that closed circle of forgetfulness against the world that's out beside, behind us, around us, there is the creation of a, a world in which we all partake and which is safe. And that, for me, is the power of story. That, for me, is why I keep writing stories in a world that makes no sense to me, making nonsense make sense. In a world in which I still don't often feel safe or understand, I keep trying to find the meaning and find the understanding. So. That's really behind. I stuck my toes in my nose. I could not get them out. I looked a little bit strange and people began to shout. Why would they ever, my goodness, I never, they got in a terrible snit. It's simple, I said, as they put me to bed. I just wanted to see if they fit. <laughs> a safe place. How is it that we can sit down with a friend or 30 friends like I did this summer friends that I hadn't seen for almost 20 years and sit down and sit beside each other and turn to each other and say, how are you? But really what we do is we start telling stories. Well, guess what happened and guess what happened and guess what happened? That simple act of sitting down and sharing and talking to each other, our stories, there's the creation of a safe place. There's connection. And I think we know that and it goes without saying, but in a way it's, it's too important not to say. That's why I write children's books. That's why I'll always write children's books. Um, one of the things you discover, however, in that world when you start going out there, I remember my first book thinking, this is so great, oh, I've got a book. 
And all of a sudden you go and you look into people's eyeballs and after how many years can I tell you all those little eyeballs looking at, out at me. Do you know what it's like time and time again to realize a book can't be a book unless it's read. A poem can't be a poem unless it's said. That you cannot do anything. You learn that so early. You're nothing without everybody else. And if there's ever a sense of the connection and interconnection and oneness between people, it's in that moment when you're looking in the eyeballs and you're going, there were monkeys in my kitchen. They were climbing up the walls. They were dancing on the ceiling. They were bouncing basketballs. And everybody's caught up in this wild, wonderful swirl. But it's not me. It's not me. And it's not them. It's the thing that happens. It's the magic in the air that happens. And I don't have words for that. I can't give you theory behind that. All I can tell you is that when you have that group of children, and they might be picking their nose, it's true, and they might be saying, can we go home now? And they are so honest, and they might be lifting their dresses at you as you're doing. Anything can happen. They don't all sit nicely and politely like adults do, which is terrifying, actually, <laughs> compared to the children. But in that moment that you're all there, something, I would say, sacred takes place. For years, you know, I, 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 I didn't go to church. I, I, I stopped going to church. I never stopped praying. My mother, thank God, I have the gift of prayer because of my mother and a gift of faith because of my father. But I stopped going to church for a long, long time in my life, um, partly because I wanted to argue with the minister every time he gave a sermon. And that was a problem. You shouldn't sit in church and go, no, that's not, I don't agree with that. No, that's not why you go to church. So I tried to find a different way you know, to try to find the connection that I wanted. Well, I realized one day, while I was doing stories with these children, that that's where God was for me. It really was in those eyes, in that thing that happened, in the thing in between, not in me, not in them, in all of that, in that community. I remember asking Frank Cronin once in a philosophy class, true story, Frank, I really need to know, like, do you believe in God? I mean, can you imagine being asked that from somebody and leaning forward and wanting to know that? And he answered, I know, the, and one of the things he answered, he said, I believe in community. And I thought about that for a long, long time and what that meant. I'm going to read a poem now, which to me defines what the ultimate act of giving the story is about, the power of narrative. When I say that it takes a receiver, the person who is the teller is actually at some point just the medium. It's, you're just the thing that it comes through. You're just the vessel. But ultimately, when, when it happens in a way that you hope that it happens, something else takes place. The receivers become the doers and the tellers. And it's a transmission that happens that way. I really believe in the words of Brenda Eulen that everyone is talented, original, and has something important to say. I actually really do believe that. And everybody in that something important to say has a story. So I believe in the trying to find everybody's voice, trying to help everybody and each other find our voice. So this poem is what it was like to be a storyteller going into schools time and time again, and this is one particular morning. What you need to know before I read it is that the Buren Peninsula is in Newfoundland, and um, it, this was happened in April way, way, way back when I was first two years of doing storytelling. In the Buren in April, one thinks of the word barren, gray against gray. The hills are stubbled with whiskers, with quills, humped backs of giant porcupines outlined against an ice-blue sky. The snow is plastic trying to melt, the color a scorched marshmallow. The grass is dead, the color is nicotine, and the road to the schoolhouse is long. We round the corner and suddenly there is a live world. Houses like children's building blocks staggered on a hill. Multicolored stair steps leading to a wharf. The mountains, like parentheses on either side, are hugging all these lives within. The ocean, cobalt blue and on and out, as far as I dare look, without weeping. I've arrived, I think, to that spot on the edge. The children and teachers are awaiting my arrival. The halls are decked with pictures, lemon tempera sun and tempera green grass. The laughter of these children sounds to me like the laughter of balloons. Unspoiled children ready to ask and touch and hear 
As we twist our tongues around syllables, I try to explain to them that poetry is everywhere, the wash of waves, the crackle of fire, that no, it doesn't have to rhyme, but it must always have a beat, a finger snap, a toe tap, that to write one must see and taste and smell and hear and feel, and more than that, must feel the taste, must smell the hear. They seem to understand. At noon when they go home, I walk down to the wharf, needing solitude, certainly, but more than that, I have an overwhelming urge to put my finger in the April ocean to test the temperature of the sea. As I sit there looking out, I'm convinced no one in the world is as lucky as I am at this moment. Then I turn to head back up, and there they are, the children of the morning streaming down the hill towards me, small children carrying smaller children, shifting babies in woolen bonnets from hip to hip, holding the mittened hands of toddlers. They reach me. They beseech me to do a reading for their siblings right there on that wharf, right there on the edge of the Atlantic. Then they tell me stories of their fathers at sea. They tell me of storms, new bikes they want to buy, and point out where they live. I leave the village, travel to St. John's, that night I dream in tempera technicolor of a poet named Pied Piper who was carried off by children to a village by the sea. When you see, it goes beyond you and the page and the book. And it goes and all of a sudden they're saying, Miss, Miss, let me tell you this. Miss, Miss, I got one for you. I got one. Oh, I got like my bum and my thumb and my thumb. And I'm like, no, that's not what I said. No, don't tell me that I got you rhyme and thumb with bum. Please don't tell me that. <laughs> there is no sense of decorum when you're with <laughs> a group of children. There is no sense of control. You have to say, go for it. I know, and one of the best poems I was ever given was by a little grade two who said, I got rocks in my pockets. And she, and she did that, but she said, you got rocks in your pockets, but I got ants in my pants. And you might say, gee, it's a silly little rhyme, but it was a grade two teacher who looked at me when I wrote a silly little rhyme and said, Sherry, it's a kind of a poem. It's a kind of a poem called a nonsense poem. And thumbtacked it on a piece of blue felt, a red thumbtack, and I watched that day as people walked by and read my poem, and when they were done, they smiled. And that's the moment that changed my life because I went, oh, something I wrote could make somebody happy. Something I said, something I did could make somebody smile. And of course we know that words can wound, that words can make people happy, that they can change minds, that they can maybe sometimes change the world. The power of words, that's the power of the storyteller, and it's something that we, all of us have. The time is going very fast. And um, I wanted to tell you a little bit. I don't want to read too much from the, the book. I'm not here to sell a book. But I am going to read a little bit from this book. Because those of us who are here, I think, probably don't have to be convinced about the power of story and the power of narrative. When we say the healing power of narrative, the original, I know that a lot of you know this, but I mean that in the original sense of healing. I'm just going to um, read from something here as to whole, to make whole, to bring together the fragmented pieces and to synthesize. That's, I don't mean healing by cure, like you can't read a story and get cured, but you can read a story and piece together things and hear a story and be a little bit more whole. I mean whole in terms of the wholeness of ourselves and our being and the world, that's what I mean. So this young man, he struggles with reading he struggles with school. His mother died when he was five years old. He didn't have a mother. He um, is one of those. He says at one point, I think if I can find it here, he says, he says, let me see. This is it. Who knew you were supposed to sit still in a chair from the age of six until the age of 18 for endless hours a day, every goddamn day, five freaking days a week, in a chair, in a row, in a classroom, in a school, School rhymes with cruel for a reason, at least to my ears. There I was all day long, only let out for recess and lunch like a dog let out for a piss and a run. <laughs> so I coped as best I could until grade two. <laughs> He's very funny. That's when I flunked. I didn't fail. I wasn't held back. I flunked. I'm a spelunker and a felunker. There's got to be a song in those syllables somewhere someday, eh? 
and then he talks about all his friends going on and him being left behind in school. And I'm going to jump ahead to the book where he, it, it, it's a thriller and a love story all combined, but I, I just want to jump ahead to where he talks about what it's like to be inside his head. There's a difference between learning and remembering, and actually it was Father George Martin who used to walk around and say, learning is not remembering, learning is not remembering, and I always, that's Father Martin in this book. There's a difference between learning and remembering. I should know. I usually can't remember what I'm supposed to, and I keep things stored in file folders in my head in no kind of order, weird factoids that don't really do me much good when it comes right down to it. Like, did you know that it takes 120 years of drops to make one cubic centimeter of a stalagmite? Or I ask non-answerable questions like, why are there short and long vowel sounds and hard sounds and soft sounds for certain consonants? Like, take, for example, the letter G. Like, did you know if you add D to anger, you get danger? So why don't they rhyme? Yeah, why doesn't anger rhyme with danger? Hard and soft Gs, that's why. But who made that rule up, eh? See, when you've got the read and wonkiness I have, well, no one could have the same wonkiness, but for me, it's an up and down kind of thing. Some reads are better than others. Some days reading is easier than other days. Like, yeah, sometimes I get my P's and Q's mixed up, or B's and D's, things you might expect, but it's complicated. Things change. Sometimes a B is a B, and a D is a musical note, and sometimes a B is an L, and grammar can change to grandma or gummy with a blink in my eye. Sometimes I hear leaf instead of leaf, and big success is basic sex. Lettuce. <laughs> is lettuce. And I might hear bells when I he read the word rings. Five is the way five appears on a set of dice to me. So I see polka dots before my eyes, I do. And I'm sure if you'd taken a CAT scan of my brain even before I messed with it, it would have looked like a few wires were fried or were frayed at the edges. This is his brain before drugs. This is his brain after drugs. No diff. <laughs> I managed to get as far as I did in school because I memorize a lot. And it helps me if I read out loud. But you can't really do that in front of people in an exam, right? Exam, eczema, same thing. <laughs> C, scramble brain. I had some good teachers over the years, but you know, some still think if you're mouthy like I am and colorful and can talk up a storm, you can read. Wrong. It ain't so. My father's been good helping, and that's not easy because of my frustration. What helps is if I use a little cardboard with a hole cut out of it and slide it along a sentence, word by word. But reading's not necessarily understanding either. And besides, you feel a little stupid with that ruler thing in school, and I go ballistic when I think I look stupid. So no, I don't often do the slide thing, and I use my thumb, as I've admitted, if no one's looking. Look, all I know is if you went to China, you'd need a translator to read the signs so you'd know where you were going and where you were. When you read like me, you are your own translator every day. Every goddamn day I open a book, I kind of don't know where I'm going. And don't even get me started about writing and how long it takes for me for one paragraph. So yeah, that's how it is. So Jake Upshore, in this book, actually tells his story. And at the beginning, he's with a, a therapist, what they call a narrative therapist. And she's trying to convince him that telling his story will be good for him, will help him for the trauma. And he's not buying it. He's like, you know, don't have me thinking these positive thoughts. I don't get this telling. This is like hippy-dippy drippy shit, he says, is what he says to her. And he's not convinced, but he finally agrees to tell his story. And of course, in the telling of his story and the trauma that he's gone through, he does end up becoming more whole, not cured, not perfect. There's a big difference between becoming a more authentic, whole human being and, of course, not expecting perfection. To be more human, I, there is no land of perfect child. There is no sea of ease. There is no candy apple trail. There's broccoli and peas. There is no suit of armor, child. There's arrows and there's pain. And when your heart is broken, child, stay strong and love again. There is no perfect person, child, not presidents or queens. There's only all us trying, child, to be human, human beings. And what Jake is trying to do is become a more human human being, not perfect. He does say at the end, healing, they say, is a never-ending process. The shrinkette's helping me with that buried deep, painful, crafty stuff. She's a really short female shrink. That's why I call her shrinkette. <laughs> Talking's still hard, and she still gets on my nerves somewhat. But yeah, it's a little bit better, he says. So writing this book, was a whole book about thinking about the healing power of narrative in all our lives. But it was really a book about discovering how powerless you are when you don't have a voice and you can't tell your story. And there is not a story that you want to tell. 
or something has happened to shatter the story that you were telling yourself about yourself. That's what, the, I think that's what this story is about, but I don't know because it'll be up to readers to take away what they think it's about. Um, when I was in Russ Hunt's class, he gave us a book. He came in and read a book to us one time, and he knew, I think, he, I, I, he said, yeah, this is the book, Sherry, I think you're really going to love, and it was a book called The Bat Poet, and it changed my life in the way some books do, and it was a story of a little bat who wanted to be a poet, and at that time, I wasn't a published poet. I was a wannabe poet. I was a wannabe storyteller. I was trying, but the little bat wants to write and wants to, and he takes his poem to someone first, and he says, I've written a poem, or will you, will you listen to it? He takes it to the mockingbird, and he recites his story, his story poem. And when he does it at first, the mockingbird looks at him and says, you know, that, that last line was two feet too short. And the bat said, what do you mean? Well, you wrote it in iambic pentameter, and da 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 and da 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 and he did this whole analytical thing of why the poem didn't work, technically. Okay? And the bat is devastated. The bat's voice has just been dismissed. Don't be so, you know, you know it's kind of nice, but you, you got it wrong. And so he goes away, and for a while he doesn't write again, as I remember the story. Maybe he does. Maybe I'm imposing what I felt when that happened to me. And he goes finally. He writes another one, and he goes, and he finds, I think it's a squirrel. And he says, would you, would you listen to my poem? And he does. And the squirrel says, oh, it made me shiver. Why do I like it if it made me shiver? And then he says, say it again. And thus the storyteller bat is born, reaching further and further for his own authentic voice and vision. Tonight I don't want you to go away thinking about my stories and the stories that any of the stories that I've told you or me or Sheriff Fitch. I really hope that tonight makes you think about the importance of your stories, your personal narratives. What are the symbols? What are the images? What are the stories you need to tell yourself? Who are the people that will create a safe place for you to tell your stories to so that you are listened to, so that your truth is heard and not judged and accepted? Where are those places and spaces in your life? Because that's what we are made of. That's what we are made of is stories. Somebody said that God invented the humans so, because he wanted to listen to stories. <laughs> I'm not sure. I want to read you a quote before I bring this to a close. It's a quote from how many of you used to watch um, Saturday Night Live? How many of you know Saturday Night Live? And it's a quote, yeah, and it's a quote by Banana Dan, -dan you know, Gilda Radner. I'm going to I'm gonna have to shuffle things here a bit to find it. Anyway, when I came across it, I thought it was really appropriate for tonight because when I called it the never-ending ever-after story, I hope that you saw that I skipped the happy part. I didn't say the never-ending happy ever after story. You know, I, I don't know, I don't think I believe that. I'm an agathistic person, and that's somebody who's not a pessimist and not an optimist. It's somebody who believes that, yes, there's, life is mixed and there's a lot of pain, but in the end, good will out. Agape is where it comes from. It's from that idea. And I love this quote by Gildan Radner. She says, I wanted a perfect ending. Now I've learned the hard way that some poems don't rhyme and some stories don't have a clear beginning, middle, and end. And life is about not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. One of the reasons narrative is so powerful and story is so powerful in our life is because for a little while things don't change. You go back to that book, the book is still the same book as it was the last time you picked it out. You go back to that story from your childhood, you remember the person who told it to you, and something's constant. It's one of the few things we have. And yet stories change. We reimagine them, we reinvent them, we tell new ones. It has to keep changing. I'm going to end with a poem, a long one. So I'm going to turn the mic on now, and I'm going to come out from behind here. I think I'm going to turn the mic on now. How do I turn the mic on? <laughs> no. Does anybody know? Is it on now? Hello? No? Hello? Okay, well, I'll do it from behind here. That's okay, as long as we don't get feedback. Okay, I can do it from here. I said I'd come out from behind the podium. <laughs> it's a story about a mouse, and it's a story about stories. Okay, but before I do it, I have to warm up with a story about a dog. 
because I met Lorna in the washroom and she and I got talking about little dogs. And so this is for you, Lorna Drew, tonight. It's called The Beagle and the Eagle and the Bugles and the Eagles Find Time. So it goes like this. I knew a beagle who loved bagels. In fact, he loved to beg for bagels. In fact, he wagged his tail for bagels and haggled for those bagels whenever bugles blew. One day, the beagle met a beluga who played the boogie woogie bugle. The beagle giggled, hi, beluga, beluga, then played a jig with his kazoo. Then the beagle and the eagle and the bugle playing beluga sailed together, saw the seven million wonders of the world. It was a boondoggling, mind-boggling, horns walking time. They played the boogie woogie eager eagle, beagle, beluga blues. But now I have to do it one more time, OK? I knew a beagle who loved bagels. In fact, he loved to beg for bagels. In fact, he wagged his tail for bagels and haggled for those bagels whenever bugles blew. One day, the beagle met a beluga who played the boogie woogie bugle. The beagle giggled, hi, beluga, then played a jig with his kazoo. Then the beagle and the beluga eating bagels, blowing bugles, met an eagle who was eager to eat some buttered bagels, too. So the eagle and the beagle and the bugle playing beluga sailed together, saw the seven million wonders of the world. It was a boondoggling, mind-woggling, horns-woggling time. They played the boogie woogie eager eagle, beagle, bugle, beluga, blues. <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to show you that in a, the thing about tongue twisters is the more mistakes you make, the more fun it is. And we don't have a lot of safe places in the world in which to make mistakes. And no matter how sad you are and students, how hard you're working and how much you despair, you've got two more years and two more sets of exams. If you say the big old beluga blues, you can't be sad. <laughs> I guarantee you, your heart will be glad. In the book, there's a mouse in my house, and I'm not going to do the whole, because I want to leave room for questions. The little mouse, um, the, the, the boy discovers a mouse. The, mouse. the mother says, get rid of the mouse, get rid of the mouse. And the boy's in charge of getting rid of the mouse. There's a child here who's now 30, I shouldn't tell you the age, who I used to say, get rid of the mouse, too. There really were mice in our house. And I would say, get rid of the mice, get rid of the mice, and leave it to my child. So this is a story about a boy who has to be responsible for like getting rid of the mouse. And when he goes to the mouse, the mouse says, like, you know, just wait a minute. You know, before, before you grind my bones to dust, I grant me three last wishes. And, and the boy says, what? And he goes, oh, I want a piece of cheese, a glass of pop, and uh, a chance to how, tell you how I got here, the story of my life, my personal confessions. It's a history filled with strife. And then <laughs> the mouse goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on, kind of like me. And on and on and on. And finally, the moment has come, and the mother's saying, have you done it? Have you, have you killed it? Have you rid us of the rodent? And the, the boy says, no, in a moment. And then he raises his hand, the, the sneaker, and he looks at the mouse, and he goes, I'm really, truly sorry to tell you, but I'm going to have to, you're going to have to die. And the mouse says, wait, can you imagine for a moment what it's like without a home, to be cold and always hungry in the dark and all alone? It seems to me you live in luxury and you've lots of cheese to spare. Would it really make a difference if my mom and you lived here? At that moment, my mom shouted, Do you think the coast is clear? I heard my mother getting closer, so I brought the shoe down, crash. But I brought it down deliberately in a nearby can of trash. OK, all right, okie dokie, Missy Mouse. You can stay, you belong. You got a place here in our house. But now, you can't invite your relatives. But your mom and you can stay. The mouse jumped up and down and said, I know how I will pay. I will come and tell you stories, and all of them will rhyme. And I thought, oh, great, wonderful, terrific. I've really gone and done it this time. And I still can't quite believe it. She said, and maybe every day at 4, could you leave a piece of Gouda cheese behind the basement door? So there's a mouse in our house. It's really not so bad. In the end, I've got a friend. Her name, Shaharazad. Each night she tells a story, the mouse who came in from the coal, the storyteller in our cellar, wow, can she get on a roll. I feed her cheese and crackers, she drinks golden ginger ale. Scheherazade, the mouse, and her never-ending tale, and here's the best part, she's even taught me how to tell some stories of my own. She says, as long as we have stories, we will never be alone. The end. a lot more that I'm going to say, but it is the time goes so much faster when you're in that circle of forgetfulness. And uh, we really did want to have uh, some question and answers, Bill and I talked about. And yeah, there's, I have maybe one or two more stories in me if you don't want to ask questions. We have two uh, mics uh, in either aisle, or at least one in this aisle. So if anybody prefers, they're not limited to us. Okay. All right. 
Anybody at all? Do you want to hear my most embarrassing moment story? <laughs> I've told it so many times. And the, um, one of the things um, when you're talking about uh, getting people to have faith in their own voice, which is what story is about, um, to play, of course, is what you do when you're a children's writer, when you're a children's storyteller. And I think I took a vow a long time ago, like in my 20s, that I, I was willing to be a fool that I was willing to be the jester. I can remember when Toes in My Nose came out, I actually did have a friend who I think didn't mean it. That was like, it's great, but who really wants to be an author of a book called Toes in My Nose? And I was like, I do. <laughs> I totally do. I do. But there was a certain sense of allowing myself to be the fool, to be the jester. There was, and you know, thank goodness I had a family that said, we love Toes in My Nose. And parents and children that said, that's okay. And a lot of professors who did too and thought that nonsense had a place. But one of the things you end up doing is playing with words and trying to get people to feel the joy of them as they come out their lips, the elasticity that you have in the saying of them. And so one of the games that I play, it's a spoonerism game, and so the poem would go like, would you like some bags and aching? Would you like it twice as slow? Do you want a cola beer? Or what kind do you want to woe? Do you think my tongue is twisted? Do you think my tips are lick? I'll say it all again, then I'll say it queely rick, queely rick, lickety quick. Lick. I know, what kind of person grows up to do this is what you're all thinking <laughs> about at me right now. What kind of person grows up to do this? So it's a spoonerism, but there was a, it's a real technique in poetry. So then I would put their names in the spooneristic language. So Trevor Smith would be Severed Trip, and you know, Kathy Powers would be Bathy Cowers. And so, for whatever reason, this just makes kids go hysterical, right? It's like, oh, I'll put my name in the lips, slippery like it. I said, okay, now you can all go home and do it, you know, because we can't get through everybody. And I was in St. John, and it was grade four students. And there were 200 grade four students in a gym one time, and we played this game, and then we had question and answer. And how much money do you make? And do you like your children? Like, what do you do with your children when they, they always say, what would you do with your children when you're here? Like, they always, do you have a dog? Those kind of things. And uh, this one little boy put up his hand, and he went, what would your name be in the lip slippery language? I went, honey, nobody ever asked me that before. Me, my name would be Fairy Shits. <laughs> and that's a true story. I've told that story so many times, you've probably heard it. But it was 200 grade four students. Can you imagine? And the teachers were at the back of the room. I'll never forget it. And, and the teachers kind of like felt, and you know, you'd think I would have done it before, but I hadn't done my own name before. I actually hadn't. And I still think that little boy knew exactly what he, he <laughs> you know, and I thought, oh, that's a great literacy lesson for them today, right? You know, so, you know, so, yeah. Oh, thank you. Somebody's got a question. Good. <laughs> You're obviously a great storyteller, verbally, orally as well as a, a great writer. I was wondering, do you find it easier telling stories verbally or writing them? And is there any fundamental difference in the process? That's a good process? question. That's a good question. When I, I'm going to use a little theory. I have done lots of theory work on it. When I was doing my master's thesis, I, it was torture for me to write that master's thesis because I was writing, writing about an oral tradition. It almost seemed to violate the very thing that I was trying to articulate, which is that the oral tradition, the sound of the human voice, which we hope we can, and the eyeball to eyeball, and cheek to cheek communication that my parents gave me, that when my mom sang to me and when my dad did the poems, that that was what creates the safe place. So here I was trying to write about an oral tradition. And it was driving me crazy, because I, so I decided, well, I'll put some videotape. I, I met my husband that year. Luckily, he was a cameraman. I don't know if that's why I fell in love with him, because I don't know, because he's visual, I'm verbal. I don't know. But at one point in writing that thesis, trying to articulate the power of the spoken word and when we tell stories, we had a, a we were at Shirley Crafts, at Shirley's daycare, at her child care, and she, we, I was there doing toes in my nose and things, and, and I was doing it with the children. But there was a next door neighbor on the other, and the other, and there was a fence separating to the two yards. And there I was with the children, and Jill caught in the camera as I was telling the stories that somebody heard from the next yard what was happening. And all of a sudden, over the top of the fence, you see all these adults <laughs> peeking over. And yet, first you see them doing this, and then you see all these adults who, you know, had gray hair, I think some of them did, becoming little children. Um, that Wings of Desire, that film, he said, if we lose our storytellers, we will lose our childhood. And there's something that I've experienced about 
telling stories where I see big people become filled with that wonder of a child again. You can see it happen in their eyes. So that moment for me is what I was trying to capture when I was writing about the tradition, the oral tradition. So at one point I thought, it's not literature, it's not literature, it's not children's literature that I'm talking about, it's, it's utterature. And there I was after thousands of pages of doing my thesis trying to articulate what it was I was trying to talk about. And I went, utterature, that's what I'm trying to talk about. To utter is to outer. So to me, utterature was all stories or, or poems that were, or plays that are included in that too. All stories that are dependent upon the human voice to have a life and a community of listeners. And that to me was utterature. So that oral tradition to me is very different than a written tradition where somebody is sitting in silence and solitude by themselves and reading. So they're two entirely different things. Now when I, and you're asking me, what do I find? There's nothing that could ever replace being in a classroom with children and doing There Were Monkeys in My Kitchen. And I at one time thought, am I going to be 70 years old? I'll traumatize them if I'm jumping around. <laughs> I will traumatize children if that happens. I can just, I even now they're like, oh, is that old lady looking at me like that? <laughs> I did The Monkeys in My Kitchen for somebody yesterday, her little girl yesterday, and she, and she said, there's the monkey woman. <laughs> That's what she called me after, the monkey woman. <laughs> but when I sit down to write, because I was an English student and, you know, I wanted to be Alice Munro or Alistair MacLeod, it's never good enough. So first of all, I struggle so hard with it. But then I also want it to be beautifully sounding on the page. And I really think I'm still writing for the ear as much as I'm still writing for the eye because I, I hear words. I hear them out loud. And voice is important. So it's... I struggle anyway. I struggle. I struggle with a 32-page book. Will take me two years to write. You know, so um, writing doesn't happen fast for me. It's a real challenge. It really is rewriting. But there's nothing that replaces, you know, having kids slime you. You know, <laughs> they come up after and they touch you and they say, "Can I re feel your coat?" And I, I'm always going to be wanting that. That's that's such a, an immediate human connection. And you know, the need for 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 narrative right now. You know, the, the walls of the cave, and now it's the walls of a Facebook page, right? I mean, that's still people trying to share their narrative and having a sense of audience. I think that's why Facebook is so big, because the people have a sense that they're telling parts of their story and that the, the story is being heard. Now, I would argue that maybe there's a fragmentation that's happening that's kind of getting a bit of, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about all that. I don't want to get off on that tangent, but I just joined two weeks ago, okay, and I'm going insane. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. So anyone? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sherry, you uh, were talking to us about the importance of, of finding our voice, um, and I wonder if you want to speak about um, uh, getting feedback, not always positive, um, <laughs> from people, and, and just some suggestions. About okay, okay. Coping with it. Well, I, you know, when I talk about, you know, narrative making us more whole in terms of that kind of healing. I don't know about you, but I'm still discovering what it means to be human. And I have a real long way to go before I can figure out that I'm that person that I'd really like to humanly be. I have a lot of things I'm still discovering. And you know, you just think you get to one place and then something happens and you have to shake your head and go, whoops, that's not quite my understanding. So the first thing I would say is that, you know, and I mean, all of you know this. I know that all of you know this. Nobody knows this. Your truth is your truth. Your truth is your truth. That is one of the hardest things to understand in the world. We are all connected. We all share the landscape of the heart. But our experience that shapes us is as much of our learning curve as anything else. And so our truth being our truth means if we learn to start to be gentle with ourselves, first of all, that our truth being our truth is okay, that we don't expect everybody to understand our truth and get it exactly the way it is for us, then when those negative things come, then maybe we can stand in our own truth a little bit, for, a little bit firmer. Most of the time it doesn't happen with that much grace. <laughs> Most of the time you're trying to say, but this is, the, you know, this is, this is, and you want to tell your story and you want it to be heard and you want it to be understood. But the truth is, is that your truth is your truth. And so 
I did have early on, I, I had two experiences early on where I thought the truth was that nonsense was wonderful and who could ever think there was anything wrong with that and it's making children happy and everything. And I remember going into a school and all the teachers were beaming at me like, that was great. Like, we didn't know what you were going to do, doing poems. What is that? Because people weren't really doing it that much then. And, and they, they thought, that's great. And I had, you know, I walked out, I suppose my head was, you know, this big thinking, this is great. I know I'm telling stories. I'm doing... And then as I was walking down the hall, and I'll never forget it, I'll never forget it because it, it just made such an impact. I was, there was one teacher that was there and she, I walked towards her and of course I just had, you know, thank you for coming and everything. And she said, uh, bye now. And I said, bye. And she said, yes, she said, that was very interesting. Well, you know when people say it's interesting. <laughs> you know right away what that means, right? It's like, oh, right, <laughs> you really hated it, didn't you? So I just said, oh, okay, thanks, bye. And she said, but of course, you know, we wouldn't want children to think that was poetry. <laughs> There's my story about that, Michelle. I mean, and I just remember, I was like, I went, <clears throat> uh, no, I wouldn't. I mean, no, I wouldn't want them to think that was poetry. I mean, the first thing I did was, no, 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 it's just silly, silly. But it was joyful, and it was filled with joy, and we just, made language, but I didn't have that voice then. So I went away, and for two days, all I could hear was, we wouldn't want children to think that was poetry. And I thought, but it's nonsense poetry, and it's a kind of poetry, and I, but I didn't have that voice then. So, you know, I don't really have the answer, because I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how we respect our truths and respect other people's truths and allow everybody their differences. <laughs> And say it's, and even if we don't understand, we respect it. Which I think the person I'm up here who this lecture is named about understood that very, very well. That you know we don't have to agree. We can agree to disagree, and we can do it with grace and respect. And uh, that's something that's hard to learn. Anybody else? Or else we don't do it with grace and respect, and it's okay too. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing. Yes. Okay. Hi, Russ. Okay. Well, let's just shout. Okay. Uh, I'm, but as you know, I'm with you in pretty much everything you say. I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about how you um, hear the voice of Carl Sandburg oh. or Percy Shelley mm -hmm. when you say, and I agree with you, there's nothing like having that one-on-one, -on -one, that face-to-face, -face, that real human voice. But I know how important those voices yeah. were for you, and I'd like to hear you okay. think about that a little bit. Oh, that's great, Russ. Okay. That's great. <coughs> well, I guess what he's thinking is, Sherry, what about when you're dead? <laughs> <laughs> you can no longer have your voice out there. No, Russ. Um, <laughs> the dead poets come to us through the people who keep them alive. Thank you, Russ. The transmission, of course, comes when we pass things down. It came through the human voice of my father. It came through you know, um, the human voice of my teachers. It came through the Stuart Donovans who said, if you're going to be in a modern poetry class, we are not reading these poems in silence. We will read them out loud in class. I caught this morning, morning's minion kingdom of daylight's dolphin, dappled dawn, dawn. And how could you not get, get excited when you hear those words out loud in the air? So of course, those of us who are here today, and and Hunt is one of them too, are trying to bring forth the poems from the past that maybe have not been heard for, from the storytellers who didn't get there. And so that transmission is essential. It's essential. I saw Bob Hawks here tonight. You know, Bob, Bob Hawks was one of the first poets I ever heard at the Maritime Writers Workshop. And I still in my mind carry around a poem in his head about a, 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 a lighting technician. I, I wish I could recite it. Bob, as beautiful as you did, a, a, a lighting man who comes in to a house with his repair kit and the lights go on and it's a little four-line poem and it's, you know, it's symbolic of the light of Christ, the light of anybody who, the light of peace, anything. And it's that voice, that voice is carried through. I carry Bob Hawks' voice because I've heard him say it. So the way we hear those stories on the page and bring them alive, I think, in the human voice is, I think, I'm just going to try and experiment here. Can everybody just remember a, child, a, a, a story from childhood, from early childhood? Just go to a song or something right now. Okay, does everybody have one in their head? Now, when you think of that, 
do you think of a person and a context connected with it? Okay, because before we come to the printed page and a printed word, we hear it through our ear and we're hearing it in an oral tradition. So I think, does that answer your question, Russ, that we're dependent on those who come after to keep the voices alive and to maybe reimagine the voices too in some ways too? Is that, okay. He's still my professor, you know, in my mind. <laughs> Did I get an A yet? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no. Anybody else have a question? Okay. okay. Hi. Hi. This is Sue. There's a storyteller. Out of Ottawa. <laughs> um, in the Pair Child Mother Goose program, we facilitate um, always in a partnership. Mm -hmm. There's always two of us. And I wondered if you could share with all of us your take on that, your experience, because that's all we're doing is nursery rhyme. Most often it's English third language, mm -hmm. but tell us about what you do in partnership. Well, I wish I could because I've been alone for 25 years. <laughs> I'm lonely. <laughs> it's very lonely, those of us who don't have travel with people. When I'm at a place where there's a bunch of other storytellers, I, I'm in heaven because I'm not alone and we're doing it. I, one of my favorite storytellers was a man by the name of Sheldon Oberman. I don't know if you know Sheldon, but Sheldon wrote a book called The Prayer Shawl, and he, it, it's a Jewish prayer shawl. It is one of the most beautiful stories I have ever read in my life, and I had the wonderful, wonderful joy of sharing the stage with Sheldon and telling stories with children together, and, you know, sh that would be as close as I was able to have in terms of partnership you know, is that I was able to share the stage with other storytellers and, and have the children right there. And I'll never forget being on stage when Sheldon told that story and watching the audience. And it wasn't me telling the stories and how amazing that was for me to be a part of his audience and be there. And when the story was, was over after, you know, he had his prayer shawl there and I watched him actually take the prayer shawl and put it around children who wanted it wrapped around them. And so it had gone from like a tradition uh, to a story, then back to an a actual thing that was happening. And the reason I use that as an example is that's how I learn. I watched other storytellers too. That's as close as I got. But I've mostly been, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've done some drama before and I, and I, I am in awe of drama people because they work as community. And they have to build something and they have to, to bring it together and they bring all these different people and make something happen. But I think that you that that the more people who kind of come together, like what this what 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 this research is doing, it's like bringing together all the disciplines and saying, you know what, theology, you know, we tell stories. Jesus was a pretty good storyteller, right? You know, psychology. Do you know that there's something now called um, it's called uh, logosynthesis, and it's an amazing thing. While well, you use the word in order to actually, you know, bring about wholeness. To somebody. I don't know if any of you saw the Nature of Things documentary a couple of weeks ago. It was on the neuroplasticity of the brain. This is fascinating research and again this goes into psychology and it's you know now we know that we can actually change the wiring in the brain. For a long time they thought once that brain is wired that's the way it's going to stick nobody will ever change. Now they know that through telling stories they can help people with obsessive compulsive disorder, people with schizophrenia, people with um, a, a whole range of things by actually taking them in, um, having them, if, if it's a trauma, post-traumatic stress syndrome happens that way, they take them in, they give them some like just easy medication, that's all they do, and then they have them tell their story. They tell their story. The first time they say, they tell it all out loud, they write it down, then they come back and next week they do it. After the sixth time, they've actually taken CAT scans of the brain and found out that they have actually changed <coughs> those patterns and those ways of thinking and they can therefore tell the story without being traumatized again. And that's through narrative therapy. This is fascinating. This is fascinating things, this neuroplasticity of the brain that we're learning about. And we're learning so much. They say the next frontier is going to be inner space. And I think that in many ways that the kind of research that's going on, but there's a lot happening with the tellings of stories in terms of bringing people to their more to a more functioning place, and that's in the field of psychology. That's just one example. I mean, anybody who, I, I'm thinking of my mom and dad. I'm thinking of my mom and dad who were part of a, of a grief share program. 
um, for people who've lost loved ones and for years. And really what they did is they sat down and they, my mom and dad facilitated, and they sat down and they listened to people's stories. And they listened to each other. And in the telling of the tales, of the telling of the stories, there was healing that happened, wholeness that happened. So um, I'm off the topic there, Bev, but I, I, you know, I think there's so much that we can do in partnership. I don't think we should, we are living anymore in a world where we should have like this faculty over here and that faculty over here and that faculty. I'm talking about university, but it's the same with people, you know, and the, the more the merrier, but it's harder and it's more complex and it means, you know, having to deal with personalities and all that stuff. And uh, I know I worked at the CBC for a year, and at the end of the year, so, you know, they asked, offered me another contract. And I knew if I stayed, I'd probably never write another story, but I also didn't really like myself very much. I wasn't good at taking direction from a producer. And I thought, well, you know, that kind of shows me, because I don't think writing actually is a collaborative experience. I, 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 think, it, I think it's very um, unique unless you sit down with someone and say, let's collaborate and write a play together or a book together. But I think the actual writing of a poem, it's a very individual you know, thing too. So does that answer? Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Yes? OK. <laughs> I heard a long time ago that uh, your kitchen was a place where you composed a lot of your word music. I was curious, um, you know, most mothers would bring a warm cloth. The little guy was making a peanut butter and honey sandwich. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm having a request for some tongue twisters to end, and that would be very good. <laughs> okay, so what he's talking about is when a child gets in trouble, what does a mother do instead of bringing a cloth and wiping his hands? So I had. <laughs> Okay, so he's four years old and he says, I want to make a peanut butter sandwich. And I say, fine, you can make a peanut butter sandwich. So he brings the chair over to the counter. He makes the peanut butter sandwich. And then he goes, no, I think I want honey. I go, okay, so here's the honey jar. And he starts getting the honey on it and he gets all stuck up. And then with the honey, and I'm watching him over there going, seeing his head. And he gets down from the chair and he looks at me really mad and he goes, oh, mom, how do you get the honey from the bottle to the bread anyway? And I went, how do you get the honey from the bottle to the bread without the bottle slipping, honey, dripping on your head? How do you get the honey from the bread to your tummy? Well, it's yicky and it's sticky, but it's sweet and it's yummy. Well, how do you get the honey from the bottle to the bread without the bottle slipping, honey, dripping on your head? You whirl it, you twirl it, you lick it up quick because you asked your mother for a honey stick. That's how you get the honey from the bottle to the bread without the bottle slipping, honey, dripping on your head. And he went, does everything I say have to turn into a poem? <laughs> A lot of sacrifice is very true. <laughs> uh, well, as uh, some people here know, I sing. And I wonder, a lot of them I sing a lot of songs that are set poetry. Poetry you know? and, and story. And it raises, raises questions because uh, some of them, the composers, don't actually fit the words of the music together very well. Okay. Hankel is one, much though we love Masai. It, Words. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are some, which is just perfect. Okay. So how, how would a poet feel about a composer messing with their song? That's a, that's that's an interesting question. Um, you know, Hank Williams, I think, said that songs are just stories with music in them. <laughs> like that's what he thought that that song was. I think that's what he how he definition of stories was. I've had um, some. Uh, some of my poems put to music, and some of them have just been so beautiful they've made me weep. And other times I thought, now that's an interesting way to <laughs> <laughs> interpret those words. That's really good. But it's such an honor when somebody does that. I get so excited because they get it that like poems are word music, right? So, um, but I mean, you know, again, it's all about interpretation. But it's been interesting to see that because. Um, I think what you want is you want the spirit of the piece to be reflected in the music, if that makes sense, if I use the word spirit. I think that you, you just don't, so if you do a higgledy piggle, I knew the beagle who loved bagels, I mean that to me almost is music, but it, you know, if it was like 
I knew a beagle who loved bagels. I don't think I would like it. <laughs> I get it from you, Mom. <laughs> She's the best storyteller in our family. She really is. We were born with the gift of gab. So um, um, if there's no further questions, I... I for bringing her in it was wonderful. Thanks to you all for showing up tonight. Thanks to you who are planning on showing up tomorrow. And thank you to Sherry. Okay, thank, thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Tell your stories. Oh, and, and uh, even though I want you to tell your stories, there's some really good books out there, too. <laughs>